Um, so welcome, my name is Lauren Maupin and I'm the manager of, of education and programs at the Kluge Rue Aboriginal Art Museum. And I'm joined uh, like by my intern, um, whose name is Lista Diamantopoulos. And welcome to the ninth webinar in a series where the Freeland Museum of Art and the Kluge Rue Aboriginal Art Collection, both museums uh, located at the University of Virginia, are investigating art forms that don't normally show up in the museum. We felt that there are all kinds of art forms that are culturally dense, deeply tied to identity, and formally and technically complex that deserved our attention. Each speaker is going to speak for about five minutes, uh, like about their own relationship with the world of fashion makeup. And then we have some questions that apply for all the speakers that we're going to um, guide our discussion tonight. And then we'll open it up for a brief uh, live Q&A at the end. So without further ado, I'm going to kick it over to D'Angelo Thompson. Mm -hmm. He's going to start with his introduction. Tonight. Yes. Cool. Thank you guys for having me first and foremost. Um, this is a pleasure and I've been a makeup artist for over 33 years, but I would say that it started at a very young age. I was very attracted to just anything abstract, anything creative as a kid. I think it was very important for me to explore creativity. And I grew up in a very small town in the rural South of Mississippi. And then my family moved to Chicago. And that was a new world for me, just being able to see different types of people, to explore the arts, and to eventually go to a high school of creative arts, which was Curie High School on the Southwest side of Chicago. And I would say that was the time that everything kind of came together. I understood what art could mean in my life. And then slowly as I went into college in New York City at Pratt Institute, I understood what, how art could just bloom into amazing things, not only in fashion, but also in beauty and art education, museums, et cetera. And I think as an artist, I use all of those elements to create. Um, oftentimes in fashion, whether you're working on a photo shoot or in TV and film, you do pull reference, references from um, all that you know and also historical parts of life. And um, it's just been an amazing journey as a makeup artist. So I've had the opportunity to do editorial, to do lifestyle, to work in commercials, also work in TV and film. And I don't know if you can see it behind me. I've won an Emmy, a daytime Emmy for a talk show I worked on for two seasons. That was a Wendy Williams show actually. And even that in itself, you know, we had all types of people on the show, young, old. And I remember Carol Channing, like staring me in the eyes <laughs> and just looking at me for a long time. And it was almost like an elder had given me a nod, you know, like you're good at what you do, continue your journey. And I think often our elders guide us in our journey, whether it's in fashion, television and film. I truly, feel extremely blessed to do what I do. And what else can I tell you? You've been able to see my bio and see what I've worked on and I'm continuously creating. I think that's the most important thing. We can never stop creating. Sometimes as artists, I'm sure most of you know, you can become stagnant and uh, it's important to keep creating and inspiring yourself. That one photo that you're looking at right now actually was something that I was able to do for commercial for Sprite. <laughs> it was for uh, a take on Wakanda forever, of course. And uh, we work with this young model and the actors for this project. And then it always continues, not only on set, but it also continues offset to find inspiration. For me, how I find inspiration is through the arts, going to museums, walking around, looking for special exhibits, no matter where I travel. I, will, I went to London once um, on a whim, one weekend, because Kara Walker was showing at the Tate Modern and I wanted to see it. And I literally hopped on a plane, went to London for a long weekend. That's how much art influences my life and also many cultures influence my life. And I'll be very brief, I'm almost done here. When a few days ago, I was on the train in New York City on the Metro and there were about seven to eight people sitting across from me. And they were from all walks of life, young and old, all shapes and sizes, different races. And I smiled and I had a smile within, but I also had a smile where I showed it because I thought they all were beautiful. And that's how I approach makeup is through my eyes. Everyone is beautiful. And only thing you can do is just enhance it. So thank you for having me. And I'm looking forward to tonight's discussion. 
Thank you, D'Angelo, so much for that um, wonderful introduction to your work and your background. Um, you. Katie, your turn. Thank you. Um, before I begin, I just want to quickly um, pay my, well, just acknowledge and pay my respects to the country that I'm situated on today. Um, and I just want to, yeah, pay my respects to the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Nation. Um, and yeah, just pay my respects to their elders past present and emerging, as well as extend that to everyone here online today and any other First Nations um, people as well. Um, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Um, so yeah, my name is Katie Carl Taylor. I'm a proud Waka Waka, Birigaba, Lama Lama, Ngāti Paro, Ngāti Kahanunu woman. Um, so my mother is Aboriginal um, from far north Queensland, as well as then my father being Māori um, from the North Island um, on the east coast of New Zealand. So I'm, both, I'm indigenous, indigenous on both sides. Um, but yeah, I'm the leading First Nations pro makeup artist here in Australia um, and the small business owner and artist behind I Think She a Freak. I also work full time in education as an Aboriginal coordinator uh, on behalf of the Wildage Foundation, um, which is situated here in WA. But I work and live creatively um, in NAM, which is Melbourne, um, on Kulin Nation. Um, but yeah, um, I've been working professionally, and I say professionally because I, I became qualified back in 2016 um, and got a diploma in specialist screen and media makeup artistry, and I became qualified there um, within hairstyling, lash tech, and obviously makeup services. Um, my love for makeup though began I would say in high school um, when I was about 14. My background though itself is visual artistry. I've been painting and drawing um, since pretty much the age of two. Um, so it was it was pretty much a given that I then naturally was um, gravitated towards makeup artistry. Um, but yeah, with the hairstyling and makeup, I only do hairstyling and makeup collectively for all my broadcasting and film um, gigs because it's ideal that in within those positions that the makeup artists can do both. Um, and yeah, I don't really do lashes because I just didn't have the patience for it. Um, but yeah, so pretty much um, I've been I've been around for like a hot minute, not as long as. I would say other makeup artists, but I feel like as a First Nation makeup artist, the experiences that I've had over the years can definitely um, equate to someone who isn't BIPOC and has been in this space for a lot longer than myself. Um, and yeah, as a First Nation makeup artist within the Australian fashion and beauty um, scene, like my main objective within existing and striving within this space was to um, make sure and always bring awareness to the lack of representation of First Nation mob, as well as um, other people of colour within the space. Um, we have this idea of Australia being a white nation when in reality, um, we're, we're one of the most diverse continents in the world, as well as Australia having a black history. So with that in mind, and the, then the lack of represent representation, um, I always love exploring and challenging the industry on its diversity. Um, so yeah, my my work extends, well now extends pretty much across the whole industry. I started off within theatre, makeup, back when I was like 14, 15, like working on projects um, in high school. Um, and then, yeah, pretty much from there onwards, I've now worked across the editorial fashion space. Um, I work now in TV broadcasting, um, film, um, campaigns, magazines, um, and yeah, wherever wherever I do then now have time, I still like to be really accessible to clients. Um, so, you know, so they can book me on the weekends um, or even for their bridal parties and things like that. Um, but yeah, I love having my hand in a lot of different avenues within the industry, um, as well as then pushing the boundaries of where makeup can really fit. Um, like for instance, back in 2019, I I exhibited in an uh, art show um, with other First Nation makeup artists and pretty much, again, was exploring and challenging the ideas of makeup being part of something like an art exhibition. Um, uh, yeah, along with other amazing First Nation artists that 
range from photography and painting and um, graphic design and things like that. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much a bit about me in a nutshell. Um, but yeah. Awesome. Thank you for that introduction, Katie. Um, I think we have a few more uh, sides. Okay, Isaac, we're excited to hear a little bit about you and your work. Yeah, okay. Okay, hi, I'm Isaac. I just wanted to say thank you also for um, including me in this. This is a really big honor um, to be part of this three panelists. And yes, um, my name is Isaac. I um, am Alaskan native, um, Kodiak is the, our tribe. It's a little island right off of the, right off of Anchorage. Yeah, and it's the hub of like all fishing for like halibut, salmon, king crab. Um, but I grew up in Salt Lake City and um, lived there until I was 18. And then I moved to Arizona and I really wanted to like to pursue something. I didn't know really what I was gonna do. I just knew I loved art, was drawing my whole life and painting. And I just wanted to do something. And then I remember walking by the mall and I remember seeing the Mac, the Mac girls and the Mac boys um, doing makeup. And I remember looking at all the makeup I was like, oh my gosh, this is like so amazing. You know, all the colors and then just seeing them blend. And instantly I knew this was like what I wanted to do. I wanted to do makeup. I was young, I didn't know how. And so I just kept, you know, trying to get like, retail jobs and trying to get into Mac. And then finally, you know, after a few tries, I got in and um, ended up working for a couple of years. And then I ended up transferring to LA and worked out there and freelanced for about three years with Mac. And then I kind of branched off on my own and started, um, went to a makeup school, cinema makeup school is where I went. And then I ended up becoming an instructor, did that for about three um, years. And yeah, I just, kind of dibble dabbled in film, TV and film. I didn't make it into the union in LA. I tried, it was just, there was a lot going on um, with, with my family and all that. But um, I ended up relocating back to Salt Lake where I'm from and um, the film industry ended up moving there. Like a lot of films were being um, filmed there. So I did that for a while. And then I ended up, um, really wanting to like move to New York and try something new. And I moved there and lived there for about five years. I, I did mostly a lot of corporate stuff with like Maybelline and L'Oreal and Garnier. And, um, but I also really had a passion for fashion and like for makeup and like just different looks. And so I definitely tried to keep myself busy on the side doing that while I was in New York. And I really loved it, I did. Um, and then from there, um, we, I lived there about five years and then we moved to Seattle and I've been located here in Seattle for about nine years. And um, when I first moved here, there was no makeup people. Like there was, I, I didn't even know what, like what I, I, I originally moved here because I was working in Vancouver on a film and um, that my, my visa didn't get extended. So I ended up having to come to Seattle and I ended up staying here for, um, you know, for nine years and then but there wasn't that much work, but within the last like eight years, it's just turned from big tech and like all these corporate companies to like, I'm just, there, that's pretty much what I do now is just all corporate, all commercial. Um, yeah, just studio work. And I love it. Um, I really do there. I also um, do a little, um, I have like a little, like on the weekends, um, I go to like some of the local powwows around here. And I like to do a, my little like lash booth. I'll do like lashes and like, I'll do eye makeup. And I usually do it to match their regalia of the dancers. And it's, you know, that's one thing for me to like give back and try to still connect and be, you know, relevant with um, my community as well as, and just, you know, have a, have a good feeling of, 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 you know, helping and showing them some different looks. I also would do airbrush looks. Like that's an airbrush look that I did um, of different war paint that, um, you know, different dancers, um, boy dancers or um, would want. And it's really, really fun. And I, I really enjoy uh, makeup. Now, um, 
I, I, I find myself doing still a lot of corporate, but also like more weddings. I'm, I'm finding, I, I really love just the full glam and color and, you know, just really perfecting. That's at Sundance. That was Rob Lowe um, when I worked at the Park City TV. And yeah, it was, that was a fun time. Um, yeah, um, let me see. I don't know where I'm gonna be. I think we're gonna stay in Seattle for a little bit, but I have been eyeing to move to Vegas. So I'm hoping in the future, we'll see where it takes me. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, Isaac. D'Angelo, did you wanna um, go through your slides a little, just quickly again, if you wanted to comment on any of them, just because um, the, the PowerPoint was doing a, a strange thing. So I'll just... Um, Pull these back up so that you can. Yeah, this image is from a commercial, a Sprite commercial that I did in Los Angeles. So it was a lot of fun. It was about three characters and um, the gentleman that played in Wakanda Forever, who played uh, the Gorilla King or the Mountain King, he was also part of it. Um, so it was a lot of fun just to be creative and have such beautiful people to work on. And this was my first book cover uh, shot by Anthony Batista and it was called Enhanced Beauty. This young lady, Paloma, I've known her since she was a baby, um, and I worked on a teen beauty book about four years ago, and I saw her dad, so I was like, hey, do you think Paloma would be interested in doing a book cover for me? And they're like, oh my God, she would. So I, you know, I pitched her the idea, like I would do any model or talent, and I said, do you want to do it, Paloma? Of course, you're going to get paid and all that stuff. So it was a pleasure. So Paloma is the cover of my Enhanced Beauty for Teens book. This was a beauty spec and specs were something that you normally would pitch to a magazine. And I just loved, I have this wig lying around and I have a wig box, you know, for different jobs. And it was lying around. I was like, you know what, I wanna, I have an idea. And I just wanted to make this really kind of beautiful fairy type woman. Um, and we shot this and I think it's one of the most beautiful images I have. This is Ife Mora Kiel and she, is, was formerly um, a rock and roll singer actually. And now she does what they call somatic therapy. And this is her headshot for her business, so. And I just think diversity is key. And having this young lady, this model here in New York City shot by Justin Klein. Um, she's with um, Studio 59 Model Management. And it was just amazing to just have such diversity and she's gorgeous, a young model from Korea. Awesome, thanks. Um, well, there's so much to dive into just based on, um, what, you know, the, what you all have already said, but I wanted to start, um, because you all mentioned being really drawn to art as a discipline and having practiced, um, you know, things like painting and drawing and other art forms. Um, how is makeup artistry different, um, or similar to like more traditional art forms like painting, um, and drawing or sculpture that we typically think of when we think about art, since you all have experience, have, have that, have that background as well. Does anyone want to go? Um, oh, go ahead. Okay. I think art, as you know, guys, when you're building a painting or sculpture, there's a foundation, right? And with makeup, there's a foundation. And on that, you build with color and layers and layers. And that's the same thing with art or sculpture or anything that's creative, whether it's a film, film, same thing. You start with an idea and then you, you build from that. So that's how I think art influences my work and the historical references within that as well. I agree. I agree. It definitely, it does start just like building a home or just like in like you know any painting you know you got to get your primer down then your foundation or you know or you, however you do it you know some people do eyes first you know but i totally yeah i totally agree um yeah i definitely agree with that um and that's pretty much something that i've said in the past when um coming up against um things like going for art grants and things like that i've had a lot of backlash where asking me like what am I doing here um and I always kind of dumbed it down a bit I was like okay makeup artist I was like at the end of the day like we're essentially just a face painter <laughs> so, so it is it's definitely an art form um 
And yeah, definitely, definitely agree with you with what exactly you said, D'Angelo. Um, yeah. That's great. The idea of mixing, um, Isaac, I think like uh, you were talking about how like, you know, you were just blown away at Mac by all these colors and this idea that you could blend and it, there's this interesting connection there between like the painter's palette as well, right? And mixing, oh, yeah. would you all say that, I mean, I presume you all have experience mixing paint. Is it similar? How, like how different is it, um, that, that kind of connection? The similarities are so I wild. Oh, sorry, I don't. Oh, sorry. no, no, you're good, too. Yeah, there you go. You go. <laughs> I was just agreeing with you. It's very similar. Yeah, it's very similar. And even um, in a sense, like, because obviously like, my background was painting and drawing, like, different ways of using those mediums. Um, and it, it applies, like, I, yeah, I think of, like, an eyeshadow. And, like, there's so many different ways of then using an eyeshadow um, you could use an eyeshadow palette as a blush, a contour. You could mix it with like liquids and things like that. You can make it then different textures out of it. Um, and that's where the real then artistry comes into play with then um, getting something as simple as then an eyeshadow and then taking it to the next level of turning it into a different medium, but it's still the same product. Um, yeah, sorry, you go, Isaac. Oh no, I, I totally agree. Um, I feel like also makeup has evolved from what it was like maybe like 20 years ago. Oh, like yes. as far, even new products coming out like have just kind of changed the whole game of like how you apply it and like how you, or how, how you thought about it, you know? I would love to yeah. hear more, more about that. Like how, mm -hmm. how have things evolved? Question for all of you. Okay. For me, I think things have evolved immensely, Isaac. I agree with you. Um, product can do multiple things now. It's not just uh, this is an eyeliner, this is a shadow. Like, you know, Katie was saying, it's more than just one product. They have multi-purposes, you know, from smoothing the skin for like what I have on now, how it attracts the light, you know. Katie, you inspired me to do my face <laughs> today. <laughs> I was like, oh no. <laughs> So, you know, foundation can um, attract light, reflect light now, uh, it can smooth out the pores. Years ago, you would have to create that texture with powders and a lot of different other things, but really now, one product can do multiple things, you know. So. Did Katie or Isaac, did you want to speak more on how, how things have evolved? How make oh, I just feel like there's so many like new products that, um, have like, they kind of, because before, like, you know, back in the day you had your pancake makeup and now you have all different types of foundations, you know, like D'Angelo was saying, like, you know, you have your light reflecting ones or you could go more matte. It's just, I just feel like there's a lot more variety um, and diversity with like um, products and how they are used. I feel like there's also newer techniques that we didn't know maybe back in like, you know, maybe 20 years ago of like applying makeup, like it's, uh, it's definitely like no one was really doing cut creases back then but <laughs> what is a cut crease for those of us who don't know um like well typically you would use shadow and build up the crease and then the um now you would cut it or with concealer but now they have like different color concealers so when you put the shadow on it can intensify the the look the, the eyeshadow look so you know, just different things that we we're not we're not seeing, but the average person these days, I feel like I see, you know, the younger kids are definitely, it's a game changer because, you know, YouTube and everything has changed a lot of things of how we perceive and how we do makeup. Yes. Definitely kids are more savvy now due to social media, I would say. So the 20 year difference that Isaac is talking about and Katie is that social media has brought so much to the forefront, even being here and talking about fashion and makeup it opens up the world, you know, to have conversations. I learn from clients as well. They don't just learn from me. Sometimes a young 18 year old will sit in my chair and she's like, have you tried this product? Have you tried that product? I'm like, uh, uh, slow down. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, this is what I have in my kit and this is what I'm gonna use. <laughs> but it, it's exciting because I learned, I'm like, you know what? I like it, show me what you have. And then I'll go to the store and try it out. It doesn't mean I'm gonna buy it and put it in my kit, but 
I like to know what's out there. So yes, it's a, it's a, it's a game changer. Yes. Yeah. When I think of the um, evolution of makeup, I'm, I kind of like to look more at the kind of, um, yeah, the kind of diversing of the, the diversifying of it all. Um, because when I think of my own evolution of makeup, I look back at photos of when I was 14 and my foundation was not my color. Um, and, but that was the darkest they had. Um, and it was beige. Apparently I'm just beige and anyone who's darker than me, we're all just then darker shades of beige. Um, but really it was so ashy and I was like coffin ready. Like I was like ready to go to the ground. Um, and so when I think of like the evolution of makeup, I, I like to think of like the shade range and, and the kind of how the industry is becoming more and more inclusive. And with that, yeah. then comes a new generation of then artists and then clientele audience that are BIPOC and can finally start fitting into the space because the ranges and the products have started including us, which then is a ripple effect because then we start seeing then more models and people on set of colour um, and that's what I've seen over my years. It first just started, I felt like I was just always alone um, in the Australian industry, coming up against everyone else. But now there's like, everyone's here, everyone can get their shade, everyone's on set. Um, and it's a lot more welcoming, which is yes. nice. Agreed. Mm -hmm. I love totally. that. Um, yeah. Interesting things that you all said there about this connection um, of well, just this going back to this idea of um, 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 a makeup practice as an art form. How does the fact that your your surface that you're painting on is a human face, right? Is a, like how, how how does makeup connect to the body in an interesting way um, and to identity? Would you say? Mm -hmm. Wow, great question. Um, mm -hmm. Do you guys go or do I? Oh, go ahead. Okay. It's a great question uh, because now I think there's, it's such, it's like a huge bowl, right? There's so many pronouns, number one. So you're dealing with identity. You're dealing with body types that more so now people are speaking up about what they like and what they don't like. Uh, we're honoring that as artists as well. Um, you really have to come into it with a different mindset. You have to come into it being open, inclusive, I write often on my Instagram, diversity matters, you know? So I think as an artist, we have to go into it with a diverse eye and a diverse mind. Um, and that's how it's helped me in fashion and in television and film. And as you guys have mentioned, it also has happened in the world of makeup, you know? It's changed immensely. Yes. So it's, there's a lot of connections. Um, it's really about respect now. It's not being an authority and telling someone what to do. It's about the respect and yeah. honoring that being, you know, yeah. and yeah. enhancing that being and bringing him or her or they or them out, you know? Yes. Um, just love everything you said um, and great question, yeah. um, Lauren. It, but just adding on to that, because that's exactly that that's exactly where my mind went to. Um, and I think an example of something like that is now working on as a head makeup artist now working on all of our first nation runways it's not so much about what the like what the model the model i feel like models back in the day like we would just tell them like this is the look this is the vision that we want it's changed now when i when i run things and i work so closely with a head stylist and hair i i consult with the models as well like, how do you want to be represented? How do you want to look? Specifically for my BIPOC models, like, we're so used to straightening out their curls or just, like, relaxing it all. Like, when they just want to, like, put their own curl cream, a lot of models come on set with their own stuff because I tell them to, if you want to be represented like that, if that's you and that's how you want to be seen, go for it. We will just enhance it and we will just, support um the idea of like how you want to be plastered up and how you want the image to come out and things like that um so yeah that was just adding on to what d'angelo said 
Um, and even just the transformation of makeup, I feel like we're, we're stemming away heaps from the stereotypical beauty standards as well, um, which is really nice. People are actually starting to really love them and love themselves, whether it be their body shape, their skin colour, their, their hair, their, their facial features. Um, yeah, people are really loving, starting to really just love them for them as opposed to yeah. wanting to look like something else. Um, and as makeup artists and as evolving makeup artists, we're always going to be here to support that and grow with them on this journey. Um, so, yeah. No, I love that. And just to kind of piggyback off what you're saying, Katie and D'Angelo, um, I also really love the, um, how the fashion industry has definitely changed. Like, they're not just casting, like, the same type of models. Like, there's actual native, like, uh, you know, First Nations uh, models that are now walking runways and they're having like the facial tattoos, they're actual native facial tattoos and they're being recognized. And also like to go on like with more diversity, I think like just like seeing like even Rihanna, how she does her Fenty fashion shows and she has every style, every style of model. It's not just like the tall skinny model. It's like every color, every style. And I just, I think I love that. I think that's what we've needed for, uh, you know, a long time in this industry. I love this because I think some people still think of makeup as like a covering up. Mm. While it certainly like has that ability uh, or that capability. Um, I love that like you all are noting this huge shift from not covering up or making oneself something else, but just bringing out more of who you are, like almost as like another form of fashion right of like expressing who you are through your makeup and I think that's just and that you all get to be a part of that process with your models I um it's just such it's so beautiful it's almost like therapeutic in a way and this really like empowering you know confidence building way um I would love to build on something Katie that you just said about how you um that you you know you just don't like create the look you create it really in collaboration with the model um I would love to hear more about like how much do other people you know um um clearly some of you do hair hair styling as well um like in the cases when you don't like how how much how collaborative is is this process not just with models but with um you know photographers and um, you know, all the people who are involved in, in putting um, a shoot together or, or a fashion show together? Um, I, yeah, like, like I said, a few, like, I've, I think my first ever runway was back in 2017. And it was just come there, do the job, this is the look, as opposed to then working under, under other amazing head makeup artists and then building my way up to myself being a head makeup artist and I knew exactly the kind of direction that I wanted to go in especially when it comes to working with other First Nation mob it's always going to be a collaboration because that's just us culturally we always we will always work together as a community so that will always then be a, applied to then working together within the fashion and beauty scene um so I think that it was just I think that just came naturally to work together um, and again, working now with other um, stylists and and models and things like that. Um, yeah, we always want to make sure that the models are feeling represented. Um, I think. Sorry, I'm losing my voice. <laughs> I feel like a really good example of what I'm trying to say is probably the Vogue cover that I did last year um, for the May issue. Um, it was, that was really, really important. And the other First Nation mob that were shadowing, because we were pretty much working together with Vogue, like makeup artists, photographer, um, hairstylist. We had then First Nation mob on set, like myself working with those um, makeup artists and their typical Vogue team that they always have. And just the importance of having us there that, I think we challenged, we definitely challenged um, working with them because they were confused as to why, like, we would work so closely with the models we, and the models would then pull us aside and be like, I don't like this, like, fix mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And just even the importance of that of having then other First Nation mob on set 
or other people of colour on set where we can turn to and provide that cultural safety, um, but also then make sure that, yeah, again, we're representing them because this is going to be their face essentially on the cover. Um, and if they don't feel represented because they're not going to do it because at the end of the day, we not only represent ourselves, we represent our community. Um, so it's, it's always right. going to be a collaboration. Um, and I find that moving forward, we should do that as opposed to just kind of putting a brief, an individual brief together. We need to create the look like collaboratively. I don't know, did that answer the question or was I just like, meet me, meet me, meet me. Oh, was good. <laughs> 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 but yeah, that, that I feel like that was the Vogue cover. Um, yeah, that, that was pretty intense. I haven't had an intense on set experience like that since sometime, since early days, since I started, because we've just been evolving that I felt like that Vogue set just kind of, it's like you take, yeah, you take like a few steps forward and then you take in several back. That's how that Vogue um, cover felt. Um, but otherwise it taught them that, yeah, we need to work together regardless if it's, if it's First Nation mob and versus the not First Nation mob or yeah, other non other non BIPOC um, people, we need to learn to coexist in the space and and listen to each other. Yeah, very true. You We're entering new territory within the industry, so that's that's how I feel. Like we're entering new territory. The more and more diverse we get, um, yeah, we need to learn to just like listen and respect each other. Sorry, D'Angelo, there we go. No, it's fine. I just think it's really, like you said, it's about respect, it's about communication. And I always say to young, inspiring artists or people on my team, I'm like, this is a pie, okay? All of us have a piece of this pie, but we're gonna make this pie really good right now. <laughs> so you talk to the hairstylist, you talk to the makeup artist, the fashion stylist, the photographer, the client, you know? And yes, you do say to the model, Hey, do you have any allergies? That's another conversation you have now, more so now than ever. Um, do you have an allergy? Is there something that a product that you don't like or it gives you irritation? So it's really about a conversation, communication, and also having your piece of the pie and making sure it's good. So the pie kind of melds together, you know. I love that. I agree. Yeah. Did you have more that you wanted to add to that conversation, Isaac, about? Um, I think they said like pretty much everything I was thinking, but yeah, I agree. It's all, it definitely is about respect and um, allergies is a huge thing because there's so many things people are allergic to these days, you know, and, you know, different primers have different things in them. And so, yeah, that's always a good question to always have with your clients. Love it. Um, you know, what's interesting to me about each of your bios and your introductions is that you all have experience in the fashion makeup world, but you also have experience in film and TV. Is that, um, I would love to hear like, how is fashion makeup different, if at all? Is it, you know, like how, what are, how is it different to be a makeup artist in those different contexts? Isaac, you wanna take it? Okay, um, thank you. <sighs> Um, I think film is a lot more, um, it's a lot more detailed, you know, like you have to, like, it's not as heavy makeup, like you're, 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 you would on fashion, but it is still a lot of makeup. It's just, um, you know, it's a, a lot lighter and you also have to think of the cameras now. The cameras are way different than they were like maybe 10 years ago. They show a lot more. So you may be adding a little more foundation versus what you what maybe the producer or the director wants and but like in fashion you know you're gonna really layer on that makeup because you're trying to make a statement uh, or whatever the designer's wanting some type of either if they want it you know muted or like loud or colorful like you you you're definitely gonna add more to that but i think film definitely like the whole 4K and all that cameras have definitely changed like with how you apply um, film makeup versus fashion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree, I totally agree. Um, having worked, I started out in fashion, did it for about 10, 15 years. Then I started adding film and television into the mix. Um, I think Lauren, we talked about this and Calista that 
it's very important to have many streams of revenue coming in. And I think in this day and age, there was a New York Times article about it that you as um, in this day and age, you're going to really have many streams of revenue. So you're not just depending on one job. And I think as artists, you know, yeah. yes, you can do fashion, but many artists, actually, I got an email today, a, a very established artist here in New York was like, hey, I want to get into TV and film union. I need you to write a letter of reference. I'm like, whatever you need. And I'm that person where I, I want to encourage other artists to branch out and not just stay in one place. You know, and it gives you more power, more flexibility, um, and also you can build um, a bigger network. So, yeah. Did you want to respond to that, Katie? Um, I was just going to add that, yeah, like I've only come into broadcasting. I'm going into my third year working consecutively on with AFL and ITV, um, which is yeah, it's amazing to firstly get a broadcast. That's pretty much where I wanted I had my hand in everywhere else and I was like you know what I want to get into like like tv um because yeah back in the academy days they always kind of hinted the trainers had hinted us if you get into broadcasting you pretty much are set for life with that kind of um especially within the bigger um tv networking spaces because it's only a handful of artists that kind of then get recommended for then other shows and things like that um, so yeah, I've come, I'm coming into my third year now working with um, with them, um, and it was amazing that the first thing was straight off the bat a First Nation um, gig. Uh, but yeah, I was going to say like the the makeup application to then to then a normal like like special occasion makeup on the weekend is definitely different. Um, as well as then yeah, I always think of the the lighting um and the lighting tones and things like that especially with it being mob and we all come in different shades of black um and yeah like we could be filming on on set like out by the mcg or we could be filming in a studio um versus then someone who's just going out that night um but yeah adding on from what d'angelo said about then having um yeah having different Working, in working across the whole industry, I, I'm such a strong believer of that. I have two assistants that I recommend that and I recommend them for heaps of jobs because I'm just like, you need to stray away from working at the counter. You need to work, you need to do freelancing. You need to work on set. Um, you need to go work on, yeah, on photo shoots and things like that. It just helps them upskill as well as expose them to the industry because they might just otherwise like one or two things or they might like the whole whole walking across the industry um but yeah that's all I just pretty much wanted to add on from what Isaac and D'Angelo were saying. Is there a context out of the like film tv fashion that or you know weekend going out or you know makeup or weddings that you all feel has the most creativity involved or that is sort of your favorite your favorite gig? I think it's depending on the project. It's depending okay. on the yeah. project. Yeah. yeah. It's um, yeah. certain fashion products can be like, no foundation, no nothing. Just do a lip stain. Okay. <laughs> and then some <laughs> products can be, this character needs to look this way. It's an 18th century. We need this, this, and this. And when you do the makeup, remember certain products were made during that time. So you can't use that shimmer or that mascara or that whatever on them because it wasn't around during that time. So that's where the historical and the artistic and the fashion all come together. Yes. So it varies depending on the project. Yeah. It's true. Yep. I watched this YouTube um, and it's like they redo like period pieces and it's done in London. It's um, And they do it all like from scratch, including like what the makeup they used. And it's really cool just to see that transformation and like what products they used back then. That's and wonderful. she really dives into like studying and like how it was made and like, you know, it's pretty cool. I love that we're getting a, a little bit into the history of makeup here because um, 
Isaac, your photos of um, doing makeup as part of ceremonial performance is really interesting because people obviously have been, you know, painting their bodies and their faces for ceremonial um, reasons for, you know, millennia. And I love that we can make that connection. I think people think of makeup as being so recent when really, um, and obviously like the context and purpose is it has changed in dramatic ways, um, but in some ways not at all. And I, I love that, that kind of historical um, connection. Uh, we have a few audience questions um, that um, have come through. Um, and actually one of them sort of corresponds to what I just said, which was um, someone's asking, how have each of your cultures influenced your approach to makeup artistry? Which you all kind of touched on here and there, but I think it, I just wanted to give you all the chance to to add to that. Um, add to anything you've already said in, in that regard. I would say like Katie mentioned, um, I'm a person of color, of course, I'm an African-American. And in my family, I can start with my family, we come in every shade you know, from Lauren's complexion to Katie, Isaac, Callista, and myself, and even darker. So I think my family influences how I see the world, you know, that it can come in various shades and it's all beautiful. So yeah, it definitely um, shows, it opens my eyes to diversity. I think that's the best way I can describe it. Yeah. I definitely agree. Um, yeah, my, my, my brothers and sisters, they're half black. And mm -hmm. so like our family's super diverse, you know, we, we can come very fair, like my mom or a little tan like me or like deeper tones, like my brothers and sisters, but they definitely have been like a huge part of um, where I do makeup and like practicing. Cause you know, my, the same doing my mom's makeup, makeup is not going to be the same as doing my two sisters makeup who, you know, have bigger features or, you know, but, but you know, just, just different than my mom. And so, I, I definitely agree with what you're saying, D'Angelo. Um, yeah, I guess, again, it just comes back for, for me personally, it came to the representation side of things where when I first started or even gravitated towards makeup, I didn't really see anyone that represented me um, within the industry. Um, and even coming out of beauty school, like there would be one other artist, but again, there was no real representation of someone that looked like me, a plus size, like of colour woman. Um, so it, within Australia, within Australia. <laughs> um, that's why I love America. I love America. Um, but yeah, so I think I had to, for myself, I had to be that person. Um, and it's been an amazing journey. Um, but to now... Uh, I think I think sometimes it doesn't really hit me the kind of like my representation and my voice within the space how much that really does extend to our women um, and our other women of color, other people of color, um, and being almost that voice, but also being um, yeah being me and being authentic within the space um, just comes back to then always yeah being a, being an Aboriginal woman I really. Um, because we're not here for ourselves. We're here for everyone else. We're here for the community. Um, and that's where kind of like culturally where I stem from with things and making sure that I always pay tribute and acknowledge um, my roots wherever I go. That's how I feel even as an Aboriginal coordinator, both my roles as a representing artist and an Aboriginal coordinator um, yeah, they, they work hand in hand. The, the main purpose of both is to be representing and be that voice, be that advocate and um, give back to community. Awesome, thanks. Um, you know, because you all sort of touched on that um, like equity and inclusion topic in different ways, there was a question about um, whether there are situations in which you encounter biases with other people in the industry um, and you have to kind of educate those who hire you. Um, have you all, I, I would guess that you've all had that experience, but um, I don't want to speak for you. So is that something that you've run into? Katie, you want to go for it? Where do I begin? <laughs> that sounds like, yes, a lot. Isaac? <laughs> Look, like the, 
the industry for me, again, within Australia, it, it's been a hard journey. Like, I don't think my viewers or I feel like only my closest, closest friends and family would know the pain and suffering that I've been put through within the industry and the real kind of tears of like how the industry has really teared me apart because of how much rejection I have gotten to the point that like I couldn't even get a, like I couldn't even get hired at like a counter store like Mac or Mecca and or Morphe and I I had I have a really good like you know, I have really good history on me in terms of working in retail and management roles. Like I was so confused and and what I offered and even rocking up to those interviews, I was the only of colour person in that room. It was like, it was crazy. It blew me every time and getting the, the oh, unfortunately you didn't get the role. Like that, I was in tears. I was in absolute tears um, that I couldn't work in the makeup spaces like that um so yeah and then there would be times that like your worth is always questioned um and at the start like you you don't really question it too much because I was happy to work for free I wanted the experience of exposure but then even now it's like a, a, I've got a good reputation for my work and for me to still be like even questioned about like my fee is like really disrespectful and really disheartening. Like, but it, but if it was a white makeup artist, like all good, like we wouldn't have a problem. Um, and I tend to always get jobs that are involving other people of color or other First Nations like gigs, which is fine. But when when things that are predominantly white and then they only want to hire you during those times is really performative to me as well. It's, it's like you you want to tick that box, but you only want to tick it like for that one thing. Um, but you wouldn't otherwise hire me off the bat, um, which is, yeah, really disheartening. But otherwise, yeah, the rejection that I've faced and even some of the blatant racism that I've faced from clients um, was is wild. Like it's it's been, it's yeah, it's been crazy, but I feel like I'm coming to not the end of it but it's not as bad because I feel like I've put so many boundaries in place and I've protected myself enough as well as making sure that the next generation of First Nation artists that come through are also protected because I feel like I've gone down that journey so that they now don't have to deal with it so yeah, yeah. it's been it's been crazy there's been times that I didn't want to be be a makeup artist anymore I didn't I didn't there was times that they made me question even me, like, do I even, like, am I even, like, worth it, worthy of this? Um, but, yeah, my mum told me after all the rejection, she told me that I was put here um, to be something bigger and to, to represent something bigger. And it's ever since then I stopped I stopped applying. And it's, it's actually a bit, bit funny now um, how the tables have turned. Those... Those brands that actually turned me away, I've, they've now had to work with me as, as a head artist, especially with um, runways, like they're our sponsors. So they've had to turn and now work for me or they send me PR. So it's like, well, well, well. <laughs> it's been a sweet. It's been a sweet. I'm very, very, yeah. But yeah, what about Isaac or D'Angelo? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Katie? Hallelujah. That's all I got to say. <laughs> but I can, I can honestly say over three decades, I've been doing it over three decades makeup. I have seen changes. In the beginning, it was very challenging. Certain people would not sit in my chair for whatever reason. It could have been because I was gay, because I was black, because whatever, because I was young. Um, and then over time, I started to win people's respect. And now I'm at a point, I know my worth. So I don't accept just anything. I know how to say no beautifully. I know how to say yes beautifully. So knowing your worth, I think is key. Lauren, yes, I have experienced, you know, you know, discrimination and different things, but I don't, I try not to harp on it. I'm the type of person like, I'll show you. I've always been yeah. there. I'll yeah. show you. You underestimate <laughs> like this little brown boy, I will show you. That's, <laughs> that's the best way I can say it. Thank you. Love it. Isaac, did you want to speak to that at all? Oh yeah, well, and just off what D'Angelo and Katie were saying, I 
Um, I definitely experienced that when I first moved to um, LA, I, I, I was like, you know, that the whole time I was like, oh, I just want to be a celebrity makeup artist. I just want to be. And everyone told me, oh, well, you got to take your book to an, an agent. You have to find an agency. And I remember shopping around for an agent for like, oh, two years. And everyone just was like, no, you don't have it. Or you don't have the right pictures or you don't have enough celebrities in your book. And I'm like, well, if I don't have an agency, how am I going to get celebrities? You know what I mean? So it was, it was quite a run around, but I think just also what D'Angelo said and Katie, knowing your worth, you know, um, standing up for yourself and just keep going, you know, that's really what helped powered me through a lot. Perseverance. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Just even like adding on like this last little bit for me. <laughs> <I'll stop>. um, <laughs> no. One thing that I've always um, mentioned again to when I get faced with like what you've just said, Isaac, with what like getting turned away, like you don't have this, you don't have that. Um, I always like to challenge that because I would have had those opportunities was I not visibly me. I, I would have had a lot more opportunity, I think, within the industry if I was white because within Australia it is predominantly white. And it's just like the same people that they keep for those years. So kind of like always challenging that narrative that had I been given the opportunity, I definitely would have been more experiences and more skill and more things to my name. But because I'm me, there's a few little setbacks there with that. Yeah, I agree. But yeah, that's just my little... Well, I'm aware of the I'm aware of the time, and I want to just ask one final question, which is where, like, we talked about how the industry has evolved. Um, where would each of you like to see it go next? Like, what what do you think? Where do you think it's going, or where do you want it to go? I'm gonna finish on that. Hmm, good question. Mm -hmm. I think we're headed towards the Jetsons. We're already there. <laughs> See, you know, from, I don't know if that was the 80s or the 70s, the Jetsons, um, that's where we're headed. You know, it's, uh, if you don't want to put your face on, you have a device. <laughs> 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 and here it is. Or the, the face is in a device and you touch it to yourself and your whole face is on. I think it's going to be AI and beauty and it already is. You can order foundations online from AI, just reading your features and your undertones and everything. And oh, right, two or right. Three samples, and one of those samples is your true color. You know, I worked for a company where I wrote their education text anonymously, of course, ghostwriter. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what they do. They send their foundations to people. You try it on and when it matches, but it's AI basically, you know? So oh. artificial intelligence will definitely be the wave of the future. Yeah. Isaac or Katie? Oh, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll go. Um, I, um, definitely like what I'm seeing. Um, I'm seeing a lot more like, um, first nations, you know, native designers coming out in the fashion world. And I'm, I'm loving it really for what I'm seeing in that. I, I think they've needed like more, more, inclu you know, more inclusive inclusivity, you know, for, fashion and I'm loving that they're also really bringing it with like native designs that are all that that are their own you know that they drew and painted on textiles or different clothing but I think for um that's for fashion but for makeup you know I it'll be it'll be definitely interesting to see like um what what's going to happen in the next 10 years but I agree um with D'Angelo it like because there's um I have a hard time finding my foundation. And so I did this little test. I think it was like El Maquillage, that's a brand or something. And they send you like a full bottle of foundation. You just do like this little quiz and they find like your undertone, your like what, like, like if you have more yellow or red in it, and then you get to, they send it to you and you get to try it. And so I think that's definitely, that I'm seeing that a lot more with brands and beauty. Katie, did you want to? Um, again, to what um, Isaac was saying within the fashion and beauty scene, like seeing more um, BIPOC within the space um, and seeing, I love how like they, a lot of designers specifically 
keep to, um, I guess, our traditions and um, don't really fall into them trying to design something to fit fit the fashion and beauty scene and fit like the, especially the big brands and stuff like that. And, and just staying really authentic to themselves. Um, in terms of then makeup, I, I would love to see um, more First Nation and more BIPOC makeup artists, especially within the Australian industry. Um, and being in head roles, because the, it's so much more impactful when you have um, BIPOC head makeup artists and hairstylists, because we, we again, are changing with the industry and, and with the industry changing, obviously, heads and things like that also need to change with it because it's evolving. Um, so yeah, just kind of, that's kind of what I want to see um, down the track. Um, but yeah, that's towards the end when we say yes. I hope it is like that because I'm sick of having to do like a 15 minute makeup look and it could just be like bliss. <laughs> Love it. Well, everyone, this has been such a fabulous discussion that has taken us, I feel like, in so many really interesting directions. And um, I'm really grateful to each of you for sharing so vulnerably and just really, yeah, so many amazing insights. Um, our next Art in Life program will hopefully be a little bit later this spring. Um, if you haven't already, be sure to check out our past ones on things like wine labels, tattoos, the plating of food, comic books, children's books, um, the art of knitting, and many more. Um, a big thank you again to our panelists um, and to all of you who attended this evening. Um, and I hope you have a great night. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Thank you.